Iran is claiming tonight that an Israeli airstrike in Syria killed some of its senior commanders. Iran tonight launched a swarm of drones at Israel. We will respond in our time, in our way. There have been a series of explosions in Iran in a city called Isfahan. It has been a whirlwind of a week in the Middle East. More on Iran and Israel in just a moment. But first, let's get to some breaking news. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Now, before we get into the latest in the Iran-Israel conflict, we have some breaking news. There has been some sort of massive explosion at a military base in Iraq. Now, the cause has not been confirmed, but the explosion took place at the headquarters of the Popular Mobilization Forces of Iraq. We don't know who is responsible, but we're going to stay on top of it and bring you more information as we know it. And now to Israel and Iran. After a brazen air attack by Iran against Israel that so many of us watched happening live this last weekend, Israel has received responded with force, with officials saying that they fired at least three missiles into Iran. This retaliation, though, has led to what feels like either a calm before a storm or the moment a storm finally starts to pass. Either way, both Israel and Iran have been eerily quiet about what went down last night. Israel saying that they are still assessing its effectiveness and the damage caused. It appears some of what they are calling uh, limited military action happened near the city of Isfahan, which is home to Iran's nuclear facilities. Now, Iran did confirm that their air defense systems were activated last night, but overall downplaying the strike, saying there was no damage to the nuclear facilities. All of this coming after Iran launched some 300 missiles and drones toward Israel on Saturday. They were almost all shot down by defense forces, Israel vowing it would retaliate. Iran, on the other hand, has said that even the tiniest aggression from Israel will have harsh consequences. And that's where we find ourselves tonight with Alistair Bunkel from Sky News reporting. After five days considering its next move, Israel launched an attack on Iran in the early hours of Friday morning. The target was an airbase near the central city of Isfahan. By first light, the skies were calm again. This was filmed at the nearby Isfahan nuclear facility. Not itself a target, but by hitting close by, Israel had made a point. By breakfast time, Iranian state media was reporting that a few small drones had been shot down. Nothing has happened. Everything is back to normal. The sound heard early in the morning today in Esfahan was not an explosion. It was our powerful air defense firing at a suspicious object. Social media in Iran mocked Israel's attack, another indication that the government was starting to play it down. Iran's president gave an address on television later in the morning and only had this to say on recent tensions with Israel. Striking Israel was necessary, obligatory, unifying and a source of pride and power for our great country. There has been no official comment from the Israeli government, although the far-right national security minister Ben Gavir put out this tweet describing the strikes as feeble. Israel's allies, who this week had been urging restraint, were noticeably coy today. I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. It wouldn't be in anyone's interests. There have been no reports of casualties from the Israeli attack, and Iran state TV hasn't shown any video of damage caused. Benjamin Netanyahu would have been given a menu of options for a response against Iran by the IDF. On the more provocative end of the scale would have been a strike against Iran's nuclear facilities. Lower down, an attack on pro-Iranian militia in Syria, for example. In one ear, he would have had the extreme right-wing elements of his coalition demanding that Israel take out a strong response. In the other ear, the US president and other Western allies telling him to take the win and walk away. In the end, he sided with neither and chose something in the middle, a limited response, which Iran appears to be brushing off. Alistair Bunkel, Sky News in Jerusalem. Alistair, thank you. NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs joins us now. Colonel, thanks so much for being with us. This 
eerie calm now. Some serious downplaying that we're seeing from Iran, saying they shot down almost uh, toy drones, as they're describing it, no real damage. Then not much word from Israel. What do you make of all this? Well, Israel uh, likes to avoid either confirming or denying any kind of attack. Uh, a response of some kind to I Iran was absolutely essential for Netanyahu because of politics inside the country, uh, not because of international opprobrium or anything like that. Uh, Iran, on the other hand, uh, is breathing a sigh of relief, and so is Israel. It doesn't mean that we're out of the woods yet, because Iran can motivate and mobilize its... Um, uh, it's proxies like uh, uh, Hezbollah in particular who are particularly dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, Israel has pulled s at least some of the troops it's pulled out of Gaza and sent them up to its northern border. But for now, uh, things are quiet. And it doesn't look like anybody is going gonna, is gonna to respond in any kind of way uh, directly. Like I said, we may see something from Hezbollah. Um, and only time will tell whether or not this quiet, this eerie, almost noisy quiet will hold, Gotti. Do you put any stock into some of the, the, the I don't know, rumor that this could be the lead up to a bigger strike? It, it could be, but it doesn't, it doesn't make a great deal of sense for uh, Israel to, uh, to strike Iran any further unless it's going to do something really dramatic. And then it includes what we heard of the real targets, the ideal targets, which the right inside Israel would love to see st uh, struck, and that is the, uh, the nuclear uh, facilities at Natanz and al-Bashir. Uh, but that's almost undoubtedly not going to happen. And Israel has other problems at the moment, including the, the economic uh, result of having so many of its uh, soldiers on active duty uh, which has had a deleterious effect on the economy, plus the fact that they do have to defend air other areas, in particular the north. So it's unlikely that Israel is going to do anything further. Uh, and, of course, the United States uh, continues to encourage Israel to stay quiet. It's got a lot of other things on its plate at the moment and doesn't need to strike Iran the likelihood of Iran doing anything further is also low. It's probably even lower. Israel is a, is a formidable enemy and can strike, uh, uh, if, if Iran strikes Israel, uh, Israel can do a great deal of damage uh, to Iran. And Iran doesn't want to see that. Iran doesn't want to see a wider war. Indeed, nobody does. And that's why it's probably going to stay f quiet for a while. Let's hope cool heads prevail. Colonel, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. And, f and for the first time today, we are getting some sort of response straight from Iran. NBC News correspondent and anchor Tom Yamas sat down with the country's foreign minister just a little bit ago this evening. Take a look. Tonight, Iran telling NBC News they will not escalate their conflict with Israel, describing last night's attack as child's play. Is Iran done for right now sending any more rip missiles or attacking Israel? If Israel retaliates and comes up with a new adventurism, then we will respond. But if not, then we are done. We are concluded. Iran's foreign minister, Hussein Amir Adulayan, would not even acknowledge an attack by Israel. Speaking through an Iranian government interpreter, he said they quickly downed the drones flying over Isfahan. They took off from inside Iran and they just uh, they, they, they flew for like uh, a few hundred uh, uh, meters and then they, they were downed and struck by our uh, air defense and uh, we, it has not been proven to us that there is a connection between these and Israel. When you attacked Israel, you telegraphed that attack. You let other Arab nations know this was happening. Did anyone, any other country, tell Iran last night this attack was coming? What happened last night was not a, a strike. But did any other country tell you something was happening and they were going to invade your airspace and attack possibly one of your bases? The two or three, uh, very, uh, they're, they're like, more like toys that our children play with, not drones. It was not worth telling us before it happened. In your opinion, 
that was not an attack by Israel last night, even though we've seen explosions on video? We are investigating this in the, the matter. The, the claim that is made in the media, according to information, uh, is not accurate. And uh, Israel is trying to, uh, after propaganda. The foreign minister warned if Israel struck again, Iran would respond with force. If uh, Israel wants to do another adventurism and, uh, and acts against the interests of Iran, and our next response will be immediate and will be at a maximum level. A source familiar with the matter tells NBC News Israel told the U.S. ahead of time about the strike. Israel attacked Iran's embassy compound in Syria earlier this month, and Iran responded firing more than 300 drones and missiles, nearly all of them shot down by Israel with considerable help from the United States and other allies. Israel, it seems, doesn't want to escalate the shooting war with Iran either, making no public comments about it. No public reaction from President Biden either. Only this from Secretary of State. I'm not going to speak to anything other than to say we were not involved in any offensive operations. Tom Yamas with some incredibly important reporting. Tom, thank you. Meanwhile, at Columbia University, crowds of students were back to protesting Israel's war in Gaza, all after 113 people were arrested by the NYPD just yesterday during more protests. This is the third day in a row students have demonstrated with no sign of stopping anytime soon. And NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton has more. We are now in day three of protests here at Columbia University, and tensions are incredibly high. Just the day after, 114 students were arrested by the NYPD, and they'll be facing court summons in the coming days. Their classmates tell me that they're shocked by all of this, that they've never seen a mobilization, the entrance of the local police onto their campus in this way. One professor that I spoke to concerned about the free speech and ability for students here to debate. Take a listen to a conversation that I had with that professor and also with a Jewish student here on campus who says that these conflicts and the rhetoric at some of these protests have left them feeling afraid. They're sitting there chanting, singing, you know, no one was in any danger. Uh, so it was a real dissonance to see the actual immediacy, the overwhelming numbers and force of NYPD. These protests, they go on and it rarely seems like they're punished. I mean, the NYPD finally getting involved was, that, that, that was a new installation that hadn't happened before. We had the opportunity to visit the campus and go behind the gates today, although we couldn't bring NBC News cameras with us. And what we saw was a scaled back version of the encampments. No tents, but still dozens, maybe hundreds of students gathered, praying, bringing supplies and food. They tell us that they plan to continue protesting for the foreseeable future. The university is saying that they expect those protests to continue, but they also expect to enforce their policies around protest. Back to you. Hey, welcome back. The jury is in, or at least seated for Trump's trial. More on that in just a minute. But first, here are some other headlines that we're watching tonight. You might have thought Congress's push to force the sale of TikTok has fizzled out, but nope. An updated version is now on the way. Now, the new bill would give TikTok up to a year to find a new owner, longer than the six months in the original legislation. It's expected to be up for a final vote in the House on Saturday, then would head to the Senate as a single bill, along with the foreign aid that most senators are eager to pass. And Grammy-winning singer Mandisa, who rose to fame on season five of American Idol, has died, according to her representative. They say she was found in her Nashville home. They don't know the cause of death right now. She was 47 years old. And late last night, a huge fire broke out in an Oregon hotel. You might recognize it is the same hotel made famous by the iconic Jack Nicholson movie, The Shining. A fire broke out in the attic, damaged some of the roof. No one was hurt, and everyone inside evacuated safely. Now, a few hours later, officials said the fire was declared under control and had not spread any further throughout that building. And authorities have confiscated nearly 50 pounds of meth hidden in an ice chest of fish at the southern border of California. The CBP stopped a man for inspection, and a canine team found 25 packages of drugs in that ice chest. The driver, whose name has not been released, was turned over to Homeland Security. And back in 2015, NASA released this image of a huge heart shape on the surface of Pluto. Now researchers think they have finally figured out how the heart came to be. They say that a planetary body likely crashed into Pluto at an angle. They say this new clue gives more info about the dwarf planet's origins, but you know, 
heavenly bodies. They need love too, right? And turning now to New York, earlier today in New York City, just moments after the full jury was officially picked in former President Trump's hush money criminal trial, a man set himself on fire outside the courtroom. We've got an image of that incident. We want to warn you, it may be disturbing. We're not going to show the video, but police say this happened in an area specifically set up for protesters, but they don't think that this act was in direct response to Trump's trial. They identified the man as Maxwell Az Azarello from St. Augustine, Florida, who traveled up to New York earlier this week. He is now listed in critical condition. And witnesses say he threw pamphlets down containing text about conspiracy theories. He threw them up in the air before dousing himself in alcohol liquid and then lighting himself on fire. I heard someone scream, he's going to set himself on fire. I turned around and I saw uh, uh, a man dump liquid on himself on his face. It came all down his shirt and he immediately lit himself with a lighter or something. And uh, everyone was screaming. Investigators say Azarello promoted a vast conspiracy on the American government, the university, political figures, major financial players, and police say they will now be reviewing their safety protocols as Trump's trial continues. And just moments before that chaotic scene outside the courtroom, six alternates were officially chosen to be on standby for the 12 jurors who will decide Trump's fate. This monumental trial is only five days in, and two potential jurors were dismissed earlier because of the anxiety they were feeling about the gravity of the case. The 12 jurors will have to decide if Trump is guilty on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, the first criminal trial ever of a former U.S. president, with opening statements now set for Monday. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now. Danny, thanks so much for being with us. It was a day of, of heightened emotions in and out of court. Is there a possibility more jurors could be dismissed? All of a sudden, alternates, uh, six doesn't seem enough for a case this big. There's definitely a possibility. That's why you have alternate jurors. In fact, it happens frequently during a trial that a juror is excused or dismissed for any number of reasons, a personal issue. Maybe the juror is not following the judge's rules. Sometimes I've had a juror dismissed uh, for falling asleep during trial. So jurors can excuse, get excused for all kinds of reasons. What you don't see is jurors who are excused between the time they're selected and before the trial starts, because normally Nothing's going on during that time. But in a Trump trial, a lot is going on, including the juror going home, thinking about what they've signed up for, and maybe getting cold feet. Or in the case of at least one juror, hearing from their family and friends who figured it out. Everyone's playing Sherlock Holmes, amateur, uh, at home and figuring out that who the juror is. And it's not limited to the public. It's members of the juror's family. So yeah, I, it's not a surprise. I think the court could really use 30 alternate jurors because I think there's a real chance they could burn through what they have and the alternates, and then you're in mistrial land, and that's not a good thing. Yeah, that seems kind of likely. Trump's lawyers motioned to change the venue of the trial. We saw that denied. Uh, what were they arguing there? Well, one of the things Trump's uh, attorneys argued in an emergency appeal was that Justice Marchand moved way too fast through jury selection. And I really thought this was going to happen because I imagine that in order to seat this many, a complete jury in essentially, really, we're talking about three days. There was no, no jury selection Wednesday and Monday was a wash. Monday, they really didn't get to jury selection at all <clears throat> until late in the day. So to seat a jury of this uh, of this importance in such an important case in three days, speaking from as someone who has been on jury selection for weeks on cases that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, so you can imagine this is just not what anyone expected. I did expect that Trump's attorneys, when the jury was seated this quickly, would have a complaint about it. And certainly they did. They would love a change of venue. The perfect place for them would be Staten Island. They would love it there. Uh, but look, I mean, that that argument was dismissed. It was denied. When it comes to seating juries quickly, Justice Mershon may be really efficient. Maybe that created an issue on appeal if he's convicted. But all in all, a very efficient three days. I said three weeks. I was wrong. Uh, Denny, Trump said he would be testifying as he left court today. Uh, what could the timeline for that look like? Ordinarily, a defendant can't, well, a defendant simply cannot be called by the prosecution. So if Trump testifies, we're going to have to wait until the defense's case and until after the prosecution rests. 
So that could be weeks. That could be four weeks, could be five weeks. I mean, after this week, Justice Mershon's indicating that he's going to move quickly. So maybe we all should shorten our timetables a little bit. But either way, you wouldn't see Trump until the defense's case. Sometimes the defense calls the client first. Sometimes they call him absolutely last. It really depends on strategy. And you all may, you also might have a situation where the attorneys are begging their client not to testify, but the client has an absolute right to testify. One other thing I'll say, and I've seen this a lot in white collar cases, the defense attorneys will tell you that their client at the outset of trial will say, I am going to testify. I'm going to get up there and tell the world. And then as the trial drags on and they see the evidence, I've seen where uh, criminal defendants maybe change their mind when they realize uh, that the case may be too strong and there's just too much risk uh, to get up there and be subject to the crucible of cross-examination by a skilled prosecutor. And yet I can't remember the last defendant uh, that would brag about ratings. <laughs> Danny Savalos, thanks so much for joining us. Meanwhile, in the skies, the FAA is addressing two big flight safety issues ahead of the busy summer travel season. First things first, sleep and more of it. The FAA is going to require air traffic controllers to get 10 hours of rest between shifts instead of nine. That comes after a bunch of close calls on runways across the country. Just yesterday, there was a close call at Reagan International when a controller cleared a Southwest plane to cross a runway just as a JetBlue plane was starting to take off. And something else the FAA is looking into, this cell phone video from a United Airlines flight earlier this month that shows a pro baseball coach inside the cockpit in one of the pilot seats during a team flight. Now, that clip was later deleted before making the rounds on social media. NBC's Mara Barrett joins us now. Mara, uh, that video is, is pretty wild. Let's, let's though start with the new rest rules from the FAA. How are they going to work with, with all the staffing shortages that the whole industry is seeing right now? It's been a huge problem, Gotti, and when the new FAA administrator took his role in October, he commissioned a study on fatigue and found that, surprise, surprise, lack of sleep impacts safety when it comes to air tra traffic controllers. And so that's what they're trying to tackle here, an extra hour of rest uh, for the normal shift people uh, working in the control office. And then and if you're working a midnight shift, they want a longer break. Now, all of this is going to take effect in the next 90 days, uh, and the FAA administrator, Whitaker, spoke to Day about how they're tackling this to look towards a solution. I want you to hear some of that. Our goal is to have uh, a rested voice on both ends of the microphone. We now have a roadmap to uh, uh, tackling some of these fatigue issues that are in the system. So again, this will take effect in the next few months, but the big issue here, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association is calling out the fact that the FAA did not coordinate with them ahead of time because if they need to give people more breaks, that means that there's a bigger hole in staffing and they're already facing these huge staffing issues. The FAA is trying to get ahead of that. They're opening uh, applications for new controllers. Uh, they're trying to train and hire about 1,800 this year. They trained and hired 1,500 last year, but there's still thousands of controllers Sure, and so that it risks the possibility of there being an even bigger gap, more safety issues, and so there's still some things to iron out here uh, between the two organizations, Scotty. And Mara, what's up with this cockpit video with the baseball coach? It seems super sketchy. Sketchy, bizarre, wild, why is he up there? I mean, those are all the thoughts I think running through everybody's brain when you first see that video. It was a chartered flight back on April 10th uh, for the Colorado Rockies. And it's important to note that there are specific federal regulations against that happening. Him sitting in the cockpit like that, they put those regulations into place after 9-11 because it's a huge safety concern. And then the fact that you can see another officer, some other staff uh, kind of in part in the video is something that United is really uh, concerned about the FAA is investigating how this could have happened. United put out a statement saying that they're deeply disturbed uh, by the video showing an unauthorized person in the flight deck at cruise altitude while the autopilot was engaged. Now, we obviously have that video. Uh, we were able to grab it before it got deleted, but this is something that FAA, United, are actively investigating to even figure out how it happened in the first place. But again, a huge, huge safety violation um, in, in many realms of the spectrum. Gaddy. Very, very bizarre. Maura, thanks so much. And free cash sounds perfect, right? Well, while some are all about those experiments with basic or guaranteed income programs, critics worry about how some people will actually spend the money. But to see how it's working out for some families in places like Chicago, let's go to Valerie Castro. 
who stole the cookie from the cookie jar. Bella Magania and her son Felix spend more time together these days. But we use your spoon. Now that the Chicago area family is a recipient of Cook County's Guaranteed Income Program called Promise Guaranteed. I saw that we qualified and I applied on a whim. The family gets $500 cash every month, no strings attached. How they spend the money is up to them. And now when you get that check, where is it going? Money-wise, it's going to cover my half of the mortgage. Opportunity-wise, I guess? It goes to so much more than that. Guaranteed income programs or unconditional cash are not a new idea, but they are expanding. Some are privately funded through donations, publicly funded by city and state governments, or a mixture of both. One of the problems that we have right now in the economy is that for a lot of folks, especially if you're a gig worker, a shift worker, if you're an independent contractor, your money is constantly going up and down each month and really locks people out of upward mobility. Amy Castro is the co-founder of the Center for Guaranteed Income Research at the University of Pennsylvania. She says the data shows unconditional cash can create stability. What happens if we create this floor that people know that they're not going to fall, fall through? Um, do they then take bigger risks? Do they set goals? Bella's goal is to finish her master's degree. The money means she can also work fewer hours. Not only can I be with him more, I can go to school. Um, it was an awesome moment. To qualify for Cook County's government-funded program, applicants had to prove their income was at or below 250 percent of the federal poverty guidelines. For a family of three like Bella's, their income had to be less than $58,000 a year. The program was capped at around 3,000 beneficiaries, but tens of thousands of people applied. So many people applied for so few spots. What does that tell you about the need in Cook County? That there's a great need. I mean, it's not just in Cook County, it's across the state and across the country. I want our program to be part of the national conversation about guaranteed income at the federal level, because it's really the federal government that has the resources to do this. Not everyone is on board with handing out cash. Arizona Republicans passed a bill to ban guaranteed income programs in the state this year, but it was vetoed by the governor. In California, a lawsuit is pending against several programs by conservative groups, calling them unlawful for choosing recipients from minority groups. Other critics raise concerns the money won't be well spent. The majority of the money is spent exactly the way anybody else would spend it, which is on food and basic necessities. Why not put some restrictions on how people can spend this cash? It perplexes me that we often ask this question, what are low-income families going to do with this cash? But we never ask that question of the wealthy. We only ask those questions of people that we, deemed, that we deemed to be undeserving. In the long run, Castro says the benefits allow people to climb out of debt and begin to save and allows them extra time. We can only imagine the possibilities if we created that level of stability for our entire population. For Bella, who's expecting a second child, her time is priceless. I feel like I get to focus more on the things that are important to me because I'm not sitting here worrying about our bills all the time. Fascinating. Valerie Castro, thanks so much. Coming up, a scary rise in cases of dengue fever in the Americas. We are talking a 50% rise. We've got those details. But first, you gotta see everyone loves dogs and the TSA, they're no exception. Earlier today, a passenger screening canine named Messi passed his last bag screening before retiring. And to celebrate, TSA agents showered him with his favorite toys. No, not soccer balls. Messi has now so many tennis balls to choose from, he didn't know which ones to chase first. I think we can all agree that being showered in your favorite things is definitely the best way to kick off retirement. Okay. Hey, welcome back. It turns out China's economy is seeing a bit of a slowdown. We're going to explain that in just a bit. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. At least 69 people in Pakistan were killed this week in severe flooding. The heavy rain has impacted basically every area of the country. And there are reports that dozens of people were struck by lightning and hurt by a bunch of other weather-related incidents. And people across India are starting to cast their ballots today in what is set to be the biggest general election anywhere in the world. There's nearly a billion eligible voters, and they're going to be voting in seven phases that's going to last all the way through June. The incumbent prime minister is trying for a third term. And there's new concerns in Argentina and Brazil and really across the Americas over rising cases of dengue fever. 
the UN's health group is actually calling it an emergency with 5.2 million cases of dengue down there already this year, all while vaccine supplies are pretty limited. And after decades of growth that made China the world's second largest economy and lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, they're now seeing a bit of a slowdown. NBC News international correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has more. For decades, the growth of China's economy was described as a miracle. Cities, industries, opportunities boomed, fueling the rise of a new and massive middle class. These are less confident days for most of China. And much of that middle class is confronting slower growth, an economic slump made more painful by a property crisis stock market route and a youth unemployment rate so high the government last year stopped reporting numbers. What it means for Li Junwei is something she thought she'd never encounter, uncertainty. In January, she was laid off from an internet company. She's 39 with a mortgage and a toddler. Suddenly, there's no income. What should I do, she says. I still feel quite lost. I get advice from friends and mentors, but I'm constantly looking for solutions. Lee posted a video about what happened to her on social media that went viral. In it, she urged people to put more into life and less into work. Now, to be clear, China's economy is still growing, officially 5% this year, though it's a target some economists regard as ambitious. The way they see it, a recovery here will be driven by Chinese consumer spending. But data show the savings rate hit an all-time high of nearly $20 trillion in February. And consumer confidence is near its lowest point. I don't have breakfast anymore. Really? Yeah. It's, to save money? Uh, save money and uh, save more time. Jia Kun Liu is hoping things will get easier. Since getting his film degree in the U.S., he's been eager to work. But here in Beijing, he says there's more competition for fewer jobs. Before, I was pay more attention to my life but right now I just pay more more attention to my like survival a lot of the nervousness brewing here is among people living in big cities and white-collar workers official numbers for layoffs are hard to come by but one unofficial indicator more working age people using libraries Social media users say they're now hot spots for job searches, applications, or just to have somewhere to go during the day. In Beijing, restaurants that usually offer low-cost meals to seniors say they're now serving a younger crowd. Wang Ron tells us that eating lunch here costs her half of what she would pay at most places, what she calls a downgrade in spending. The rise of a middle class here helped China's government build a reputation for sound economic management. But post-COVID, Beijing has been putting money into backing businesses and industries and not giving a boost to households to get them spending again. It's feeding a trend called reverse consumption. It's sort of like budgeting out loud. My spending philosophy is to save where I can and spend where necessary, says Vika Chen, who works in public relations. She says she and her friends share clothes, travel less, and shop wholesale or discount platforms. She says most people she knows are anxious about stability these days, but that for her, it's a matter of mindset, and she'll manage. Nervousness about the economy here is having a knock-on effect. There's also an increase in Chinese middle-class migration to places like the U.S., the latest figures from the Department of Homeland Security show that the number of people with passports from mainland China crossing into the U.S. without proper paperwork has surged. More than 24,000 Chinese migrants have been detained in the last six months alone. That's up 7,000 percent from the same period three years ago, most of them crossing from Mexico into California. Janice, what a fascinating window into their economy. Thank you so much for that. Meanwhile, it has been 25 years since the horrific shooting at Columbine High School outside of Denver, Colorado. Twelve students and a teacher were killed in that attack, bringing with it this horrific modern era of school shootings. NBC's Kate Snow visited Columbine to see how they're still trying to move past their darkest of days. People think of Columbine as what occurred 25 years ago. We don't see it as that. We see it as this is our home. This is a place that we feel safe in. 
As teenagers crowd into Columbine High School, their energy feels inspiring. A generation of students building their future on a campus with a tragic past. Current principal Scott Christie and former principal Frank DeAngelis are showing us the Columbine of today. So this is the cafeteria. It used to have the library upstairs. And you've changed that completely. Now, a vaulted ceiling filled with panels of aspen trees in memory of the 13 who died that day. Twelve were students. Dave Sanders was a coach and a teacher and the father of Connie. We really felt initially for a few years he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that changed to he was in the right place at the right time. Why? Once we started realizing the impact that he had. Sanders saved many students that day. Over the years, I've run into people that were his students, and I had one, one couple ask me to hold their child, and they said, this baby wouldn't be here without your dad. Mm. He had saved them in the cafeteria. Lives that wouldn't be here. Lives that wouldn't be here, and, you know, for all of time, there will be people that exist because of what he did that day. Ashley Gladder was just 11 when her brother John Tomlin was killed. He was just a very kind, caring, sweet brother, just one of those boys that has a sensitive side and is very thoughtful. Both women say their losses gave them a greater sense of compassion. It completely changes your world, your perspective on everything. But it also gave me a really big heart for kids who had been through loss. Connie is now a mental health specialist working with people who've committed violent crimes. Can we link that directly back to what happened to your dad? It is linked directly to what happened to my dad. I see it as carrying on his legacy. It's really important to me that we stop the violence where it's starting. So we decided to come back in. Former principal DeAngelis helped lead Columbine through its darkest times. Now he works with a network of principals who've endured tragedy, counseling school leaders when shootings happen. What do you do at the first graduation? How do you work with the media? What do you do about re-entering the building? What do you do about memorial? And you but even more than those practical matters, DeAngelis says Columbine now serves as proof that a community that's been through so much can ultimately become a source of joy and pride. And when I do reach out to these other communities, I'm stating, I know where you are now, we were there, but 25 years later, we're stronger now than what we were. And I really believe that. Hey, welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following right now. The trial of an Arizona rancher who is being accused of fatally shooting a migrant on his property near the U.S.-Mexico border could see a verdict soon. Now, the jury is right now weighing his case. He could face 10 years in prison if he's convicted of second-degree murder. And staying in Arizona, a woman has been arrested, accused of attacking a school bus driver. Video shows the woman yelling at the driver, demanding her to get off. Then she returns later, throws a bunch of punches, even pulling her by the hair. It happened while kids were on board, and that woman is now being charged for felony for aggravated assault. And for the very first time, China is sending giant pandas to live at San Francisco Zoo. Now, this is part of China's symbol of friendship with the United States. China recently broke a decades-old panda loan spell by sending a couple of the black and white bears to the San Diego Zoo. We've got an update on Tesla putting its foot down on Cybertrucks. That's ahead in the future of everything. But first, we're going to turn to Apple. China has taken a big bite out of the apps, Apple App Store in China by ordering the removal of WhatsApp and threads in that country, citing national security concerns. Does that sound familiar? And that comes as Congress is weighing a TikTok ban and the legislation here and tensions over technology between the United States and China are extremely high. Telegram and Signal, two other messaging apps based outside of China, were also yanked from the app store there. And in the future of fighter jets, the U.S. military says the world's first known dogfight between a human pilot and an AI-controlled fighter jet took place in California last fall. The test showing a preview of the future of autonomous air-to-air -air combat. And turning now to Tesla, just days after the company laid off 10% of its workforce, it is now recalling all Cybertrucks over a pretty eyebrow-raising problem with its accelerator pedal. And it might have started 
when this happened to a Cybertruck owner, Jose Martinez. In fact, I don't think we've got that TikTok video, but he posted a TikTok video in which you can see the gas pedal or the accelerator pedal, because it's an electric vehicle, uh, get stuck after the front cover got uh, pushed up. And so the NTSB is, uh, the, uh, the National Highway Safety and Traffic um, Board is now saying that they are looking into it. Meanwhile, before we go, bears and California are synonymous. It is the state's national animal and even appears on its flag. And now new legislation in the state is pushing to make 2024 the year of the California grizzly bear. So here's your 60 seconds of bears to take you into the weekend. We think there are about 700 to 800,000 black bears across all of North America. Fewer than one person is actually fatally injured by a black bear every year. The bear is back in my yard and uh, climbing my tree, followed by the three little cubs. And then I guess the bears, the cubs got hungry and they woke her up and they scampered down the tree and she threw herself on the back and the three cubs proceeded to nurse. And then when they were done, they went back off into, I guess, the woods. I went into the kitchen to put something on the table. I turn around, and the bear's right there. I could watch that all day. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here on Monday. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.